So, last, we finally get on to what I'm really here to talk about, that's the video games industry. And how it's, for me, it's been an amazing, uh, what's been achieved in a relatively short time. You know, if you look about the games industry in terms of the film industry, we're only in the 1930s, and yet we've achieved so much. And um, I got into the video games industry really on the back of one of my books, Death Trap Dungeon, in the 1980s. Um, a small company startup called Domoc asked me to write um, the design for their launch title, which was called Eureka, and, um, which I did, and it was pretty successful. And I joined the company after selling out of Games Workshop in the early 90s. And Domoc metamorphosed into IDOS, and um, I was chairman of IDOS from 95 to 2002. And three years ago, IDOS was acquired by Square Enix of Japan. So Square Enix have now got three, three labels. Obviously, obviously, its own label with Final Fantasy and, and Dragon Quest and other major titles. Of course, there's the IDOS labels, and they also own Taito with Space Invaders. So they're sort of global developer and, uh, and global publisher with, with deep pockets listed on the uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange. And in this world of you know, extremely expensive um, productions of, of AAA games, you need to have deep pockets because uh, you get one or two misses and you're in uh, severe financial trouble. But I'm delighted to say that Square Enix are in fantastic um, condition at the moment, having um, <clears throat> benefits most recently from the release of the new Tomb Raider, which I'll talk about later. So where did games come from? Well, they really started in, in the early 60s. Um, Space War was a wasn't a commercial product. It was developed by Steve Russell in his laboratory. It was a simulation of two um, spaceships uh, with limited fuel and uh, limited uh, weaponry. And it was just this sort of simulation, never commercialized. It wasn't until Nolan Bushnell uh, came along with the Atari Corporation and, and launched Pong. And I think there's still lots to be learned from a game like Pong. I mean, clearly it's not. It's not selling on the back of its graphics. It's all about, all about the gameplay, because it's just one pixel moving across the screen. And when people ask me what are the three most important things about, about games production, I will say gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Um, of course, technology and graphics play a very important role, but there's, to my mind, they're still supportive of the gameplay experience. You will always buy a game which is great to play, but average to look at over one that is you know, great to look at, but average to play, because you're playing it for the experience of playing, not just for looking at. You just want to look at something, you can watch a film. So gameplay, for me, is always the most important part of any game. So games entered the home in the early 70s uh, with Magnavox. They, in their marketing, wrongly stated that you needed, or implied that you needed a, a Magnavox television to play games. That wasn't true, of course, but they suffered the result by implying that. And again, it was down to the Atari Corporation with its Atari 2600 in 77 that really saw the boom in gaming. Here was a game with um, an interchangeable cartridges. Uh, it was two player in the living room. Everybody was playing games. I think 40% of the United States population were playing games when the 2600 launched. The Japanese saw the opportunity and marched into the industry, uh, particularly in the, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the arcades, games like Space Invaders and Asteroids. Uh, in, the, in the late 70s, there was such a frenzy about playing games in the arcades that there was a shortage of 100 yen coins, and the Japanese Mint had to do an emergency mint of 100 yen coins because they were all stuck in the Space Invaders machines. So let's go a little memory lane while we'll I have a drink of water.
and games entered uh, UK homes and, in, and of course the rest of the world big time in the, in the mid 90s with the launch of the PlayStation and it's software that sells hardware and Tomb Raider was one of the driving forces of, of the PlayStation in particular. But of course today there is a, a myriad of, of games enabled platforms available to everybody to play games on. And new hardware being launched all the time, we've heard about Valve's new Steam Box and Nvidia's Project Shield and uh, more economical devices coming uh, from Kickstarter funded projects like GameStick and Ouya. So, um, you know, games technology and, and, and games themselves are pervasive. As the gaming industry is big, it's often not understood that the value of the games industry is bigger than DVDs, bigger than box office, bigger than music, and bigger than books. People today spend $50 billion a year on software sales. And that's because we're very good at generating emotions in people. It, games have become an art form. We can make people happy, we can make them sad, we can make them laugh, we can make them cry. And it's forecasted that the games industry is going to rise to $90 billion a year by 2015. Of course, when it came, started off, it was kind of guys making games for guys, but now there's so much more diversity as, as women and older and younger people being brought into the industry to create a much more uh, diverse cultural uh, content. So there's something for everybody now, which is great to see. The, the art and the industry is still driven by the, the big uh, blockbuster titles, the AAA titles that you've played on, on the consoles, games like FIFA, Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty 4. Uh, you know, these are huge, huge franchises. And, um, but often in the media, games are often talked about in a negative light. They tend to pick on one or two titles that have got 18 rated and assume that they're all played by children. Um, only 5% of games are 18 rated, 95% of content is certainly family friendly. And of course, there's a, a robust rating system in PEGI, pan-European rating system, which of course advises um, parents and children of what's suitable for them to what play and what isn't. So we're a very responsible industry from that point of view. Um, but still, the, that, that perception often exists in some of the popular press that you know, whilst a, a war film is perfectly okay, and you know, a war game is somehow kind of odd, but uh, I guess these people are being marginalized as, as games becomes more inclusive in society. And if you look at about the positive games, when you play a game, you're solving puzzles and problems, you're learning about choice and consequence, you're learning about simulations, you're learning about intuitive learning, you're learning about management, um, um, social aspects, technology, even dexterity. You know, they're, they're a good thing from that point of view. And you can use games as a learning tool for teaching mathematics in particular. Games are very contextual and relevant to children and you can learn while having fun. Why should learning have to be dull? Let's make it fun. You know, why have a, a boring geography lesson, geography lesson about urban regeneration when you could use SimCity in, in, in a contextual sense? So I think we should see more about the positive in, in games being used in education. You can use games as a training tool. You know, the armed forces, um, surgeons, uh, doctors, um, Pilots can all use you know, games as simulations to train, obviously without any risk of injury to anybody. And games, of course, enable uh, creativity, whether it's Little Big Planet on, on PlayStation, where you're building levels and sharing it with your friends, or creating whole new universes using Minecraft. Who's played Minecraft? Yeah, that was created by one person. And I'll talk about the opportunities in games later on. But this started off from one guy, a notch person in, in Sweden, with an idea to do something different, to build worlds, kind of in the way, sort of digital Lego, as it were. So let's think more positively about the games industry. You know, in the same way as we look at a child, we think good things when they're reading a book. Let's think, also think good things when they're playing a game. You know, BAFTA certainly celebrates it as an art form, so I think society should as well. And you never know, one day we might get a headline like this. Hopefully in my lifetime. <laughs>